Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers identification requirements, loitering laws, and reasonable suspicion, and is brought to us by Royal Muscle founder Hellcat Infamous's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. Before we dive into the interaction, I want to give a big thanks to the sponsor of this episode, Policy Genius. There's a lot to be thankful for this holiday season, and if someone in your life relies on your financial support, whether it's a child, aging parent, or even a business partner, Partner, you need life insurance. Policy Genius makes it super easy to compare quotes from over a dozen top insurers all in one place. And you can work out how much life insurance coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price in minutes. Eligible applicants can get covered in as little as a week thanks to an award-winning policy option that swaps the standard medical exam requirement for a simple phone call. This exclusive policy was recently rated number one by Forbes, higher than options from Ladder, Ethos, and Bestow. You could save $1,300 or more per year on life insurance by using Policy Genius to compare policies. And when you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and scheduling at no cost to you. With unparalleled customer service, it's no wonder that Policy Genius has earned thousands of five-star reviews across Trustpilot and Google. Getting started is super easy. Just head on over to policygenius.com slash audit the audit and let Policy Genius's team of licensed experts guide you through every step of the insurance buying process. Thanks again to Policy Genius for sponsoring this episode. On June 4th, 2021, the owner of the Royal Muscle founder Hellcat infamous YouTube channel, who we will refer to as Mr. Hellcat, parked in front of a pump at the Quick Trip gas station in Locust Grove, Georgia, and exited his vehicle to make a phone call. After about 20 or 30 minutes, Officer Pitts, Officer James, and Officer Mosley of the Locust Grove Police Department approached Mr. Hellcat and began to question him about his activities. I live on So, the reason I'm asking, we've been here how long? Probably 20 minutes? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah, I got I, any, I hadn't gotten any gas. You hadn't gone in and gotten any food. No. You parked at a gas pump. And no. I know I know the tank's not on the side. It's on the other side, right? No, I'll never take this stuff away. So, what's, what are you doing? I'm just I'm just chilling. I don't want to go home to you. I can't, I can't sit in the parking lot. Because I, I live out here. Where are you living? You have some ID? Who's your ID? Or is it in the car? It's on me, but what's, what's the car? Who's here? Nah, I mean, you can make it super difficult, but you do nah, need to be I'm just wondering why, why y'all... Why, I've literally been on the phone just talking. I know. That's Go ahead and get your ID, and then while, while you give us your ID, she can speak with you. But you need to identify yourself, so go ahead and get your ID. Officer Pitts asks Mr. Hellcat to provide his ID and implies that she wants to confirm that he actually does live in the neighborhood. Georgia does not have a stop and identify statute that requires individuals to identify themselves to police officers during Terry stops. However, under Georgia's loitering statute, which is found in section 16-11-36 of the Georgia Code, officers can request that individuals suspected of loitering identify themselves. The law states that, quote, a person commits the offense of loitering or prowling when he is in a place at a time or in a manner not usual for law-abiding individuals under circumstances that warrant a justifiable and reasonable alarm or immediate concern for the safety of persons or property in the vicinity. A law enforcement officer shall, prior to any arrest, afford the person an opportunity to dispel any alarm or immediate concern which would otherwise be warranted by requesting the person to identify himself and explain his presence and conduct. The statute also lists an individual's refusal to identify themselves as a factor that may be considered in determining whether alarm is warranted by the individual's behavior. However, it is unclear whether a court would agree that Mr. Hellcat's behavior warranted, quote, a justifiable and reasonable alarm or immediate concern for the safety of persons or property in the vicinity. In the 1995 case of Evans v. State, the Georgia Court of Appeals concluded that reasonable suspicion existed to stop a group of individuals for loitering after they slowly drove through a shopping center parking lot for 45 minutes without parking or entering a store, and slowed down even further to closely examine a type of car that is often stolen when a high number of automobile thefts and break-ins had occurred in the shopping center parking lots. But in the 1996 case of State versus Banks, the Court of Appeals held that standing on the side of the road for no apparent purpose in a known drug trafficking area was not sufficient to support a reasonable suspicion of loitering, despite officer testimony that this was a common method of conducting drug transactions. Here, the officers cite concerns that Mr. Hellcat may be engaged in drug trafficking based on his behavior 
Cure and patterns of past drug sales in the parking lot, as well as their observation of a known drug offender approaching him and speaking to him. If a court agreed that this was sufficient to give the officers reasonable suspicion, they would be within their authority to request his identification and an explanation under the loitering statutes. But Mr. Hellcat would not be obligated to provide it. Of course, it's important to keep in mind that officers would also have the authority to take these actions without detaining Mr. Hellcat, regardless of whether reasonable suspicion existed. So right now what it falls under is loitering. So loitering, loitering. Yes. yes. Because like, if you were like, getting gas, waiting on somebody, like, if you were doing anything other than just kind of like hanging out, it wouldn't be an issue. Well, I've, I've been on the phone. The, we know. This area is known for narcotic activity, it's known for criminal activity, so that's reason, another reason why we're speaking to you. We want to make sure that's not a foot. Right here, people will park, they'll go over there, they'll wait right here, they'll wait for somebody, they'll, they'll do something like that. And what? In the under a street? Bro, you have no idea. So, well, I, yes. I, I live out here. I, I, I believe you do. It. You know, you have your ID with you. Is the, is the license, or is the address on your license current? Is that no. your, okay. What's your current address? The state's definition of loitering is doing something not like the norm. Hanging out at the gas pump, not like the norm. You know what I'm saying? So we we have to just kind of get out. Now, if you to like take off and run as soon as you see us over here, well, why, not? why would I do that? Well, so that's it. That would add to it, but you didn't. So it's, it makes it look a lot better. Do you get what I'm saying? Officer Pitts attempts to explain Georgia's loitering law to Mr. Hellcat, although she fails to include the requirement that the suspect's unusual behavior cause reasonable alarm or immediate concern for the safety of persons or property. Anti-loitering laws, which make it a crime for an individual to be in a public place for no apparent reason, have a long and controversial history in the U.S., and they generally have been found to be unconstitutional when they broadly prohibit all types of loitering. U.S. loitering laws were modeled after England's quote-unquote poor laws, which which were created in the 1600s during an economic depression to address the issue of large quantities of unemployed workers roaming the streets. As briefly discussed in a previous episode of ATA, the first major challenge to the constitutionality of an anti-loitering law was decided by the Supreme Court in the 1972 case of Papa Cristo v. City of Jacksonville. In finding an anti-loitering statute that prohibited loitering and defined loiterers as, quote, persons wandering or strolling around from place to place without any lawful purpose or object to be overly broad and, quote, void for vagueness, the court held that because there were no standards governing the exercise of the discretion granted by the ordinance, quote, the scheme permits and encourages an arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement of the law. It furnishes a convenient tool for harsh and discriminatory enforcement by local prosecuting officials against particular groups deemed to merit their displeasure. It results in a regime in which the poor and the unpopular are permitted to stand on a public sidewalk only at the whim of any police officer. After the Papa Chris decision, the majority of the country's loitering laws were revised to include additional offenses associated with loitering, creating what are known as loitering plus ordinances. While some of these loitering plus statutes have still been found to be unconstitutional, the Georgia Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of its loitering statute in the 1984 case of Bell v. State, concluding that the language used in the statute made it clear what conduct must be avoided and prevented the possibility of arbitrary enforcement. But, but I, I literally come here all the time. I live, I live here. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, that's fine, that's but fine. you can't just, if, you're, if you don't have, if you're not doing any business, if you're not getting yeah. gas, you're not going well, to get food. I was actually finna go in there, well, I just had a phone conversation. Well, that's cool, but now that we've had this communication, it's what they call dispelling the alarm. Now that we're able to, to figure out, okay, this guy doesn't have any issues or anything like that, then we can be by our merry way. But we never met you a day in our life. I never, I've never met you. I've never gotten. She's out never of met you. He's never met you. So we're just doing our jobs. What we're, what we're getting paid to do. Mr. Lawrence, finish up your phone call. Go inside, do your business if you got to, and then head on home. All right. Yeah, but second thing, you're. It's like I've go, never go look up loitering in in Georgia no, code I, section. My, my, my father's an entire sheriff. Okay. I, well, I know, but I've never. Like I said, this this air is known for for drug transactions. We're gonna make sure none of that's occurring here tonight. No, I've so. I've literally been in the public eye, and I haven't spoken to them. And I, I know you saw the weird girl run up to my car, and I'm like, Yeah, yeah. they just came from a party with a bunch of with a bunch of um, a whole 
ton of drugs, and we're sitting well, right there see, with my, our blue lights on. I do a lot of stuff in the community and shit, so I, my car is like really well known. I race at Silver Dollar, mm -hmm. I do track events, I don't do no drug activity. And like you said earlier, the reason we got out with you and asked you and didn't just like immediately throw you in handcuffs is called dispelling the alarm. That's all that happened. We sat there for a while. We, we observed you, we were watching, okay, this guy's not getting gas, he's not going in there, we're watching everybody come and go. So it drew our, already drew our attention. Then we saw somebody that we dealt with earlier with a whole bunch of drugs around here coming up to you. I'm like, okay. Right. So and they it, said, hey, I see your right. car everywhere because I live out here. They said, we see your car, SRT on the side. Hey, I which, said, thank you. Which makes sense. And that's the reason we came over here to introduce ourselves, to dispel the alarm, make sure there's nothing nefarious going on. Now we're going to be about our way. Because that, now if, if we thought something nefarious was going on, then we'd be going a whole different direction. You understand? But we have to dispel alarm, make sure nothing nefarious is going on. You understand that? Officer Pitts says that the only reason that Mr. Hellcat wasn't immediately thrown into handcuffs is that the officers wanted to give him the opportunity to, quote, dispel the alarm. This statement is another reference to the Georgia loitering statute, which states that, quote, unless flight by the person or other circumstances make it impracticable, a law enforcement officer shall, prior to any arrest, afford the person an opportunity to dispel any alarm or immediate concern which would otherwise be warranted by requesting the person to identify himself and explain his presence and conduct. However, this does not mean that Mr. Hellcat was under any legal obligation to dispel the alarm that the officers were claiming was present. As the Georgia Supreme Court discussed in Bell v. State, the case in which it found the loitering statute to be constitutional, the statute, quote, does not require a suspect to provide information, but rather guarantees him the opportunity to explain his conduct, thereby possibly dispelling the officer's concern for the safety of persons or property before any official action is allowed. The court also clarified that the statute did not allow an individual to be convicted of loitering whenever they fail to explain his conduct and presence to the satisfaction of the arresting officer, stating that, quote, The statute, in fact, safeguards against this situation. Section B provides in part, No person shall be convicted of an offense under this code section if it appears at trial that the explanation given by the person was true and would have dispelled the alarm or immediate concern. Therefore, if the officers had arrested Mr. Hellcat for loitering, a jury could still determine determined that the explanation he provided for his conduct was reasonable enough that it should have dispelled the officer's alleged concern for the safety of persons or property in the vicinity. I have a good night. I don't have one on me. I'm Officer James. It's Officer Pitts. That's Officer Mosley. I mean, and I, and I definitely encourage you to go look up the code section, OCGA loitering, L-O-I-T-E-R-I-N-G, look it up. The officers eventually left without arresting Mr. Hellcat, allowing him to continue with his day. Three days after this encounter, Officer Pitts was terminated from her position at the Locust Grove Police Department. It is unclear whether Mr. Hellcat filed a complaint or plans to pursue legal action. I reached out to the Locust Grove Police Chief Derek Austin, but he would not comment on the incident featured in this episode. This could be due to the fact that he's the third Locust Grove Police Chief that's been hired in the past four months, due to the previous two being fired and jailed for stealing money and evidence from the department, and he was not the chief at the time of this encounter. Overall, the Locust Grove officers get a C-, minus because although there is an argument to be made that the officers were lawfully operating under the authority of Georgia's loitering code, they failed to accurately articulate the statute to Mr. Hellcat, maintained an accusatory and condescending demeanor throughout the interactions, and based their decision to initiate contact with Mr. Hellcat on questionable grounds at best. There's a fine line between criminalizing innocent behavior and investigating unusual conduct. And Officer Pitts's original reason for stopping Mr. Hellcat was because he had been in the parking lot just as long as the officers had. By that logic, would the officers not be just as guilty of loitering as Mr. Hellcat? Regardless of their suspicions, the officer's description of George's loitering law was incomplete, and appeared as though it was vaguely relayed to Mr. Hellcat on purpose in an effort to quell his suspicion of misconduct. There is no denying that much of this interaction's questionable conduct could be attributed to the cryptic and ambiguous language of Georgia's loitering law, and this interaction perfectly demonstrates how loitering laws translate to being practically enforced on the streets, and why they are vehemently opposed by many constitutional scholars and legal professionals. Mr. Hellcat gets an A-, minus because although he failed to invoke his right to remain silent, he remained calm and collected throughout the interaction, calmly complied with the officer's orders despite a clear sense of reluctance, and for respectfully challenging the legitimacy of the officer's conduct. Being 
being randomly approached and accused of criminal activity by members of law enforcement is an emotionally taxing experience, especially when your actions were overtly innocent. But Mr. Hellcat remained calm and compliant throughout the encounter nonetheless. The Locust Grove officers were presented with a set of facts that they chose to derive the potential for criminal activity from, rather than accepting them for their innocent nature at face value, which strongly suggests that some degree of confirmation bias may have been at play. Confirmation bias is often considered when discussing wrongful convictions, and is generally referred to as when a person selectively seeks, recalls, weighs, or interprets information in ways that support their existing beliefs, expectations, or hypotheses. There is an argument to be made that officers often experience confirmation bias as a result of their training and the effects of hypervigilance, and it is possible that constantly being exposed to crime and a sense of potential danger would psychologically predispose an individual to a more suspicious and accusatory mindset. Setting aside psychological theories, Mr. Hellcat conducted himself well during this encounter, and I suspect that he had some degree of involvement in Officer Pitts' termination, considering that he did manage to acquire the body camera footage from this encounter. Be sure to give Mr. Hellcat's channel your support. You can find a link in the description below. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.